Hello and welcome to the Ness and Soccer Podcast. I am Mark with Marcus. We are back. No Nicholas Goss. World Cup <laughs> break is over, or post World Cup break is over. If if you've missed us, thanks for thanks for catching back up. We look to turn to the club season. Diving right into Premier League action because we're recording on Thursday. Premier League starts tomorrow, August 10th. Yes. And the Premier League transfer window ended today at noon Eastern time, and it was thrilling. No, no it wasn't. No. It was a little boring, but a lot of finalizing of moves, and I guess one thing that stuck out to me more than anything else, and maybe it's because of the, the lack of moves within the Premier League, was that I guess the Premier League is at, at least the lower level teams are at a bit of a disadvantage with their season beginning as early as it does and their transfer window closing as early as it does because they kind of have to scramble to sign players and the rest of the European teams can kind of sit back and wait and sign players at a later date. This You're is saying exa- the Premier League is at a lower le- level teams are at a disadvantage? I think or so. What about the big Premier League teams? Well, maybe it's, uh, I guess they both are. I would think the lower teams maybe more so because maybe they have to sort of uh, finagle and, and wait and see where the big where the market sets itself and where the big players fall, and then maybe they can do a better job of how they want to sign their players. I In don't years past, yes. Yeah. This time, I don't think so, because lower level Premier League teams have a lot of money to spend, and they've yeah. been throwing it around. I think I saw Watford was either trying to sign or buy a player for 30 million pounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Watford, you could have bought the club <laughs> Right. 10 years ago for 30 million pounds. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so much money in England going on now that low level Premier League clubs can get expensive talent. Right. I don't know how good they are, but they can get expensive players in ways that they couldn't even three years ago. So maybe uh, anybody crying for, for the Premier League needs to stop crying for the yeah. Premier League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and at the same time, <clears throat> they, the teams aren't necessarily turning out to be better than in European competition. They're not, not exactly doing terrible by any means, but there's not some sort of dominating trend by English teams in European play of, as of recently. No. And certainly uh, not in, in, in conjunction with the price of the league going so high. But... Yeah, let's. I guess the biggest move of the day, unless you wanted to gripe more about how how big the transfer fees have gotten. Sure, sure. They're, they're a joke now. <laughs> transfer fees don't reflect how good a player is. They don't reflect. I don't want to say completely, but you know, this isn't necessarily a blanket statement. But yeah, it doesn't reflect how good a uh, player is. Doesn't reflect his standing in the game relative to his peers. And it only shows how desperate the buying club is. Because I think the inflation in the fees have escalated to a point where it's out of whack with where players actually stand. We can go back to that Watford example. They have Mm -hmm. so much money that they can go and get a 30 million pound player where 10 years ago if they couldn't get a 3 million pound player. Another good example, and I always find a way to fit Roma into our shows, but... Mm -hmm. Liverpool signed away Roma's goalkeeper, Allison for a $62 million transfer fee, I believe was the number. And I believe... I it was £62 million. Pounds. 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 Yeah. Which I think at the time was the highest bid for a goalie yes. in European soccer. And I remember seeing that, and I remember or Allison is a, is a great goalie, but it just really seemed like a is lot. Is he great? Uh, he's yeah, pretty he's, good. He's pretty good. Was and he the best in Serie A last year? Probably not. Is he the best? Is he going to be the best in the Premier League? Probably not. And it's just yeah, the the absurd amount of money being thrown around to acquire players. And I, it seems like there needs to be some sort of money ball approach that's going to balance this out because the teams aren't nece- the teams that are spending the most aren't necessarily becoming the best. And I think another approach will come just out of that fact that teams are, are going to realize we shouldn't just be throwing all of our money around because it's not necessarily making us any better. Well, what do you do with money other than spend it? Uh, spend it on coaching? 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of money floating around, and I don't think a lot of teams and directors of teams know the best way to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there will be a correction over the coming three to five years or so. But yeah, right now it seems like uh, teams are stockpiling players and buying up the best talent from elsewhere, and there's nothing you can really do to stop it. Mm-hmm. Well, let's move on to the actual moves that took place. Mm -hmm. Courtois moving from Chelsea to Real Madrid goalie was the biggest move actually near the deadline. Right. Uh, you could say, I mean, the biggest move of the whole summer was obviously Ronaldo moving. Yes. But, uh, so this falls obviously below that, but it's a very big deal going to Real Madrid where he'll challenge for a starting spot. And at the same time, Real Madrid will have a lot of games with all their different competitions. So I think both Courtois and Kaylor Navas will see a good amount of playing time. It's just who's going to start the biggest games, right? Yeah, and right now we don't know. Uh, Kaylor Navas had a great quote. He said, I have as much desire to leave Real Madrid as I have to die. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> he's not... Uh, Kaylor Navas isn't going to give up the job without a fight. And sure. by the way, he's won the last three Champions Leagues. So, yeah. you know, I kind of was going to ask the question, who's better, Navas or Courtois? I would think uh, Navas right now. So and why did Real Madrid make this move? Because yeah, Courtois is just... Because they could. Because they could. Uh, they've been thinking about replacing Navas for... A year or two. When Novice came, I don't think anybody would have thought he did. That was in 2015 that he'd come in and have three Champions Leagues under his belt. Uh, he replaced, I think he replaced Iker Casillas directly, who was Real Madrid's icon and captain and longtime goalie, but ultimately was pushed out. And he's winding down his career in exile in Portugal. Yeah, I... I'm not sure why. Real Madrid have just thought that they've needed an upgrade at goalkeeper for the last three or four years. And they wanted David De Gea. Man United wasn't letting them go. So it was really, you know, next best choice, Courtois. Mm -hmm. Courtois wanted to go because he has two young children that live in Spain with his, I want to say, former partner. Or maybe they're still together. I don't know. Uh, but he wanted to be closer to his kids. And mm -hmm. this is strange how this went down with Chelsea because... Chelsea knew, uh, or at least I knew from last spring, that Courtois wanted to go. He wasn't going to sign his contract. Well, they didn't want him to go on a free transfer at the end of this season, lose mm -hmm. him for nothing. So they knew they were going to lose him. He came back, was supposed to report for training Monday, went on strike for two days, then Chelsea sold him. Why didn't Chelsea do this earlier, and why didn't they replace him earlier I think those are two of the biggest questions, and I think that's going to cost Chelsea. And this, I, I'm not even going to try. Give it a shot. Kepa Ariza Balaga. It's not bad. Am I close? That is five times better than I thought you would do. <laughs> uh, I, I Thank you. I don't even know. We're just calling him Kepa. Everyone's calling sure, him Kepa. Kepa. And I think that's just going to be on the back of his shirt as well and he's probably not worth the record fee i would imagine as we were talking like in the sense of what we were saying so earlier. yeah he was allison was the most expensive goalkeeper ever for a few weeks yeah not and anymore now <laughs> keppa is i don't want to say i've never heard of keppa i've never heard of keppa I, I heard his name for the first time five days ago uh -huh. and yeah transfer fees they're a joke because yeah. my litmus test is, uh, you know, I know there are always new players coming up and blah, blah, blah. But if me, Marcus Kwesi Omar, does, have not heard of you, then how are you worth a record fee? I don't, un I don't understand. It's, it's pretty bizarre. I just, he's so young. He's Spanish. He's Spain's under-21 goalkeeper, and he's the backup to David De Gea. Yeah. Uh, he's 23 years old. 23. Um, Which isn't that young. In soccer terms, oh, for a goalkeeper, that's a that's an infant. Mm. Uh, he signed a seven-year contract, which, jeez, you know. Well, maybe Chelsea's, he'll be great. Chelsea's going all in with this kid. Yeah, uh, you know. So even if he's no good in the first three years, they still have four years of him. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I've I've never really seen him play. Uh huh. 
think he was Athletic Bilbao's number one keeper for a season or two. Right. Yeah. Who knows? The winner here, see, th- this is the other thing with these moves. Like, I'm not convinced that anybody really was a winner or even that big of a loser. Like, Real Madrid gains Courtois, but they already had a great goalkeeper. Yeah. Chelsea loses Courtois, but got a ton of money, but then spent it on this Kepa kid. So I guess initially I want to say that they're a loser, but it also depends on how the career of a very young goalkeeper pans out. Yeah, well, you know, they still don't have... uh, They kept Eden Hazard, which was probably the most important thing they had to do this summer because Real Madrid wanted him or still wants him. And maybe he wants to go. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's been talking about it for the last couple seasons or hinting at it. Chelsea still needs a striker. Uh, Alvaro Morata, he was uh, their record signing last year. Didn't really pan out, and he's still there. Uh, Olivier Giroud is there, who won a World Cup, which I still can't believe. <laughs> and he, he rode a bus to the World Cup title. Is what he did. <laughs> no, he played. he started seven games and didn't put a shot on target. Nuts. Bachu, Michi Bachuai is uh, their third striker. So, yeah, Chelsea's, they kind of bought Giroud in a panic because Morata wasn't working out. They still haven't replaced Diego Costa, and that was probably their biggest blow last season. So you think Chelsea is still sitting outside the top four? Yes. And will end up at five or six again. Where did they finish? Six? Uh, fifth last season but but well out of the top four now but won the FA Cup oh well that's great yeah (laughs) I don't see Chelsea changing their position no or improving their position right it could be worse it could all go up in flames so on the other hand Liverpool seem to leave no stone unturned yeah big spenders in the summer does that make them title contenders what they were able to do because they, of course, had their great run to the Champions League final. Yes. With the incredible year by Mohamed Salah, who, despite being injured, uh, what you would expect, he would not be at the exact same pace, but score a lot of goals again next year. And now maybe their defense is a little more shored up. And is that going to be enough to catch Manchester City? That is the idea. Yeah. They also lost Emery Chan who went to Juventus uh, on a free transfer. And Nabi Keita came into the midfield. Uh, Fabinho came in. They have more options in the midfield. Defensively, you have to think Allison is an upgrade on Loris Karius and mm-hmm. Simone Mignolet. Liverpool should be improved. I think they were third last year, or were they fourth? Liverpool was fourth, two points shy of Tottenham. Liverpool is still 25 points behind Man City. Well, so that's something that we... Of course, there's no way to like look at a 100-point season and not marvel at it. Yeah. But there were a couple times where I feel like we talked to each other and thought that the gap wasn't quite as big as the, the table made it out to be. That maybe Manchester City maybe should have lost a couple games and maybe the teams like Manchester United and Liverpool should have won a few more to kind of close that gap and mm-hmm. make it a little more respectable. Yeah. But that's all hearsay. What actually happens on the field is what matters. In the transfer market, Liverpool are probably the only ones of the top, maybe Arsenal. I don't know. Are the only ones at the top who have used the transfer market to boost what I expect their uh, finishing position will be. Right. Chelsea... Man United, Tottenham. Tottenham. Let's. Tottenham did not make any move whatsoever. Yeah. And I thought that that was crazy. And then you pulled the stat out on me. If you want to share it. No, go ahead. You. Well, okay. So no <laughs> Premier League team since two thousand is since two thousand and three has not bought or sold any player in the summer. I think it was just bought. Just any bought. Player. Okay. Uh, well, still. either way, yeah. Tottenham. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've kept their team together, and the manager came out, Pochettino came out, and was just gushing about uh, sometimes you have to behave differently in the sport than everyone else, and, you know, <laughs> he's, he's got great players here, and they finished second and third and fourth, and all in recent years. Tottenham still was not good enough to yeah. even challenge for the title. 
And last season, I think, was a little bit worse than the previous season. You know, I yeah, think they sort think of was. lost ground on the on, on the teams they were chasing. So, and going well, going into last season, Tottenham was it was this. I felt like the feeling with Tottenham was all right. Now we're here. Now we're ready to really challenge for the Premier League crown. Going into last season. going into last season, and it became. Clear that they were very good once again, and yeah, not going to really be a challenger. And that would seemingly spark something more like Liverpool, what Liverpool did, to really get enough pieces to get to the next level, as opposed to just stand pat. Yeah, Tottenham has a lot of faith in their players and in their squad, and I'm wondering if it's misguided. Uh, There's also this big effort to try and uh, get young players in and you know, get some of their academy player, academy graduates some first team minutes. But yeah, this, this Tottenham team, they weren't world beaters last year. Uh, they haven't been really world beaters since the uh, Battle of Stamford Bridge, which was, I don't know if it was the season before that. Okay, that was 2016. So yeah, 2016, May 2016 was the last time Tottenham really looked like challengers for the Premier League. And they stood pat, and anybody at Tottenham will tell you it's not because of their stadium and that, you know, they haven't invested in the squad. Right. They're building a new stadium. Its completion appears to be behind schedule, and they probably won't move into it until September or October. And then there's always some hiccups with new stadiums and teams not being right. comfortable and familiar. I see Tottenham slipping out of the top four, which is what I'm saying. That'd be fun. See, I would like to see that kind of go up in flames. And it's kind of a... Because as much as we were talking about how we are annoyed with how big the transfers are these days, I also am annoyed with a team thinking that they have what they, what they need when they didn't have what they need the year before. Yeah. It's a weird yeah. arrogance or cockiness that really just has no place. It's like, you're still taunting them. You're still... I think they're lying to their fans. Yeah. Uh, in a coordinated public relations effort between the board and the manager. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I haven't spoken to many Tottenham fans recently, but they, they can't be happy about this. And they have to play in the Champions League as well. Yeah, not so, an easy schedule. Yeah. Speaking of fans and organizations and the relationship between the two, I have learned in the last 30 minutes that you were boycotting, talk, talking about Arsenal, Mm-hmm. and have since lifted that boycott. I Not yet. We'll get to it later in the show. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I, you know, it, I have Arsenal reloaded here in our rundown. I thought maybe that was going to be you opening up your boycott. Yeah, I mean, they've been busy in the transfer market. I don't see... The real impact is going to be under the new manager, Unai Emery. Yeah. Uh, how much does he shock the systems of these players who have stagnated for the last three or four years um, we don't know but I'm not going to talk about my Arsenal boycott yet <laughs> Arsenal's transfer business was uh, busy I don't know if it's transformational sure new managers West Ham and Everton under new managers as well yeah busy uh, in the transfer window these West Ham Everton Wolves uh, Wolves don't have new managers but Everton I want to talk about because they just just right at the end of deadline day, made three signings. Yeri Mina from Barcelona, Andre Gomes on loan from Barcelona, and the third one is a Brazilian named Bernard, who uh, I think he was playing at Shakhtar in Ukraine. I didn't see that coming. I, mean, I thought deadline day was going to be an absolute snooze, but their manager, Marco Silva, who was the one they were chasing and destabilized Watford last season over. He's gotten a lot of backing from the club, so there shouldn't be too many excuses for Everton. Where did they finish last season? Everton finished eighth, five points out of European play. Hmm. Behind Burnley. There's no reason Everton shouldn't finish seventh or higher. Uh I mean, the whole club has been angling to uh, put this kind of structure in place with this manager for uh, well over 12 months so this is their this is their chance West Ham has Manuel Pellegrini in it's kind of interesting West Ham is 
the quintessential English club. Well, they've been around for 100 plus years and have this rich heritage of producing English players that go on and become very good. They hired Manuel Pellegrini and their sporting director, whose name I don't recall. They've gotten a lot of players this summer and West Ham is going Latino, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting because it's in, well, it was normally based in East London. Well, it is in East London. Uh, they're a little far from their spiritual home of Upton Park. They're now at the Olympic Stadium. Yeah. And yeah, that move really sent shockwaves through the club. And I think the new manager and the new director of football and the new signings sort of show that uh, this, isn't, this is no longer your father's West Ham. Right. Well, evolving with the rest of the times, I guess, and the rest of the league. Yeah. Before we move on from transfer talk, I think maybe the biggest steal or sweep in and, and surprise move was outside of the Premier League altogether between the French League, Serie A, and La Liga as, what's his name, Malcolm, a Brazilian <laughs> playing for French club Bordeaux, Malcolm. Bordeaux and AS Roma both announced <laughs> that the deal worth 30 million euros had been agreed upon. You've been waiting weeks to talk about <laughs> this. They both announced that it had been agreed upon, which, frankly, like, it's typically a deal will be done and dusted before the teams ever announce anything. So when you see that a team has announced something, that means, you know, handshake in full, at least we thought, until Barcelona comes swooping oh, they in. they shook hands. And, yeah. And Barcelona comes sweeping in, provides a much better deal, uh, the details of which I'm not sure, but Roma's deal was for 30 million euros or pounds, so it's got to be significantly more than that, and steal this young Brazilian player, Malcolm, right out from under Roma's nose. He's now headed to Barcelona. Fans of Roma were waiting at the airport for his arrival, <laughs> but I guess that's what makes the drama so great. Mark, you forgot the best part. His mom was waiting at His the airport, His mom was too. already in Rome. And the kid said, no, I'm sorry, mom. Yeah. Come to Barcelona. Get and back on a plane. he decided not to get on the plane and got on another plane instead and left his mom at the airport in Rome <sighs> waiting sure she... for him to sign. Yeah. Do you think she minds? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Son of the year 2018 will <laughs> not go to Malcolm. But, yeah, so just kind of a – as far as just – things that were drawing attention for reasons outside of just the player and the money. That was probably the most interesting transfer story, I thought, of the summer. Yeah, I mean, these things happen. Transfers get hijacked. Uh, we thought Jorginho was going to go to Man City for months. It looked like Man City was going to sign him from Napoli. Chelsea gets uh, Maurizio Sarri, mm. the coach from Napoli, and the first thing he does is call Jorginho and said, come with me to Chelsea. And Jorginho does. Transfers get hijacked. And all right, so we didn't write this down in our rundown, but it seems for two years now, Christian Pulisic has been rumored here and rumored there. Yeah. Is it probably good that he isn't going anywhere and that none of those rumors have seemed to be actually all that serious? Because of his development, he will continue well, the to develop rumors are and serious. Play. The interest is serious. It depends. Dortmund, I think Dortmund is lost its way mm -hmm. over the last few years. Their transfer and squad planning uh, seemed to be a little more scattergun than it once was because big teams in Europe and, of course, Bayern Munich have been Potion. picking picking their squad apart yeah. systematically for five years. It's good that Pulisic is a young player getting games at a big club, but eventually that's not the best environment for... A player to be in if he wants to go to the top right uh, but I think he could maybe do. use one more year at Dortmund and, and then, then he'll be ready to to go yeah yeah and I hope he goes to Bayern Munich when he leaves Dortmund that'd be cool as opposed to an English club so one more uh, Thanksgiving in Dortmund at, at Pulisic's apartment have you heard about that yeah where the <laughs> Americans gather and yeah. yes yes I have that's funny all right, well, so that covers most of the transfer window. Obviously, there was more things that went down, but can't cover it all. We only have so much time. Yeah. 
Let's kind of do a, a quick fire through the EPL. We've already kind of covered a lot of this through talking about the transfers. But real quick, if, if there's anything, what are you most looking forward to with the upcoming EPL season? Something to do on the weekend mornings. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, being a Premier League fan, it's a, it's a lifestyle. Uh, right. Uh, some people like to go to brunch and have mimosas on Saturday and Sunday mornings. Uh, that's not how I roll. <laughs> you watch soccer? Yeah. I am most just, for, just for 40 something weeks a year, you know. Right, and then, <laughs> you know, you get yourself a nice summer break, unless there's a World Cup. <laughs> unless there's a World Cup, yeah. But even the three weeks between the World Cup and the start of the Premier League just seem to drag on and on and on. Uh, yeah, I've been feeling a little lost without it, so. I might not be as devoted a Premier League fan as you, but I like to follow maybe like one team every year and pick it for a pretty arbitrary reason. A different team? Yeah. It's interesting. And so this year I will be following Wolves as closely as I can mm -hmm. because they're a promoted team, mm -hmm. seems to be a lot of excitement around the team, mm -hmm. and probably, or maybe has the best of the promoted teams and could do even better than you would expect any any old promoted team to do. And dare I say challenge for European play? Oh, Mark, you were prepared on that one. Well, um, yeah. I was ready to shoot you down, but no, Wolves, uh, among the promoted teams, Fulham, Wolves, Cardiff City, I think Wolves ran away with the uh, championship championship you know championship second division uh, mm -hmm. title last season of these teams they have the most resources they have the most coherent uh, planning and they also have you know some dare I say a couple stars in that team uh, Ruben Neves is one I'm thinking of he's a young Portuguese center midfielder Basically, Wolves is owned by a uh, Chinese consortium mm. and with serious links to Jorge Mendes, who is uh, arguably the super agent among all super agents. The Wolves have been trying to downplay his role for much of the year. Uh, the rest of the uh, championship, second division, uh, a number of teams last season sued Wolves for unfair practices. Uh, due to this managerial structure they have uh -huh. where Mendes is, uh, long story short, they're signing players and paying them salaries that are too low for their ability. Okay. Uh, that's the accusation. You because know what? I, I kind of like that wheeling and dealing. It makes me <laughs> okay, like him even still? more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't mind a little bit of evil, uh, or not evil, but... Uh, a new way of behaving going sure. on. All the right. pack, the pack of wolves, they stick together. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> they're doing something that uh, I don't know how many other first, you know, top flight teams have tried this before, but which is basically giving the agent the keys to the club. Um, so far, it's working. Yeah. They have a Portuguese coach, and yeah, I don't think any Wolves fan will be crying foul. And, okay, so quick firing continuing. Manchester City ran away with the league last year. No team has repeated since 2009. Will they repeat? And how close could they come to being as dominant as they were last year? I think they will repeat um, because they've been uh, harmonious and... No major disruptions or departures. Uh, I think Riyad Mahrez coming will give them another dimension and a little more quality in their attack, not that they needed it. Um, I mean, they got 100 points, scored 100-plus goals. I don't think they'll be as good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't think they'll be as good, but I do think they will still be too good not to win the Premier League. Uh, this team last season was one of the three or four best Premier League teams ever. Yeah. And yeah, I don't see them not winning again. I 
I, I guess I'll take them to win again, but I think it'll be much, much closer. I think within five points of winning. I hope so. And I think they'll finish first with Liverpool in second. And I guess Arsenal will jump back into the top four with all the moves they've made. And Manchester United will drop to fourth, hmm. which I think would be a big jump for Arsenal. But I think I like their new coaches signing, which kind of leads us into our next topic of new coaches in the Premier League and who will have the biggest impact, which I guess is basically who will do the best. My vote is Arsenal. Where did West Ham uh, finish last season? West Ham. Couldn't have been too good. 13th. 13th. Um, I think West Ham will be better. Everton should be better. Chelsea, I'm not sold on. Yeah, I guess uh, Emery at Arsenal. Unai. Yeah. Um, And I don't think it's because of him. I think any Arsenal manager that came in after uh, Arsene Wenger would have the biggest impact. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily going to be positive. (laughs) <laughs> I think it'll be positive. Sure. But. Okay, and. You want me to explain the boycott? Yeah, that's really what I've been waiting for this whole time. <laughs> when you. We, so we write down a rundown for our show, and I Marcus put, puts put in, in. at the bottom. Second to bottom. Marcus lifts Arsenal boycott, yes. which I really didn't know exactly what that was going to be. I've refused to talk about Arsenal. Um, for months. The last nine months of Arsene Wenger's reign, I removed myself emotionally from Arsenal's results uh-huh. uh, as a coping mechanism. I knew I knew it was the end for them. I think they had six losses before Christmas, and I looked at the standings one day. I was like, oh, no, this is, it's gone bust. It's all over. Um, and, yeah, yeah, we knew that by about uh, March or April that, you know, when they engineered that Wenger's departure and made it look like he wasn't fired, but he was fired. Um, yeah, I, uh, so I decided I wasn't going to, I was going to emotionally remove myself from the results. That's where it started. And then the World Cup came around, and I said, I'm not talking about Arsenal until after the World Cup. And then uh, after the World Cup, some of uh, my Arsenal friends were, you know, we exchanged some, I wouldn't say exchange, but they sent me anxiety-filled text messages about (laughs) what Arsenal's doing and not doing and winning the league and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm not talking about Arsenal until the week before the season starts, which was last Sunday. I said until the Community Shield which is the uh, curtain raiser for the season. Sure. Because I didn't want to start worrying about Arsenal. uh, Because I've done enough of that over the last... You deserve to break. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yes, as of now, I'm going to re-invest myself emotionally in Arsenal's results. I think Unai Emery and the new regime Will, uh, and Arsenal actually, uh, boy, lots going on with Arsenal. <laughs> There's been a decade long civil war at boycott level that just ended Tuesday when Stan Kroenke agreed to buy out Alexander Uzmanov's shares. Uh, Kroenke is notoriously frugal and secretive about how he runs the club, and uh, the savviest of Arsenal fans realize that he was probably more problematic than Wenger. Yeah. Um, in terms of Arsenal slipping behind the elite. So that ended Tuesday. Kroenke uh, all but owns the club, and he's going to be able to uh, be more secretive and take more money out of the club if he wants. But I think having everybody in place, uh, everybody sort of agreeing on the strategy and the approach from the manager, yeah. Scouting director, football relations head, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think initially, I think the next, the first half of the season will be very good for Arsenal. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. Like, yeah, everybody yeah, in one direction. Everybody's rowing in the same direction for the first time since 2007. Um, I, yeah, I think that'll be, uh, I think that'll be good until something happens and 
you know, more factions emerge. But, yeah, between now and uh, January 1, I think it's a good time to be an Arsenal fan. I just hope the, uh, just hope the football's as good. Okay. You know, it, it, well, it, sure. it, hit, it hit some heights under Wenger, and I always uh, like to, until the last season or two, always got a good show. I just hope that remains the case. I'm sure they're happy to have you back on board, Marcus. Uh, no, I never left. You never left, but, yeah. but never, you know. Never supported another team. I just, uh, you know, coping mechanism. I, you know, I saw troubled waters ahead, so I prepared myself. And our last topic, I guess, was which, which promoted Premier League team will do best? I think we kind of both said that Wolves. we thought Wolves will do best. Yeah, Cardiff City's going down. Mm-hmm. Fulham has a puncher's chance of staying up. Right. Well, I, I won't. I'll make my story quick. Okay. Uh, I once again atten- attended a live soccer match, mm-hmm. which I've said we should talk about whenever we do that. A professional match, not just any <laughs> any match. <laughs> uh, so I, I I gave in to uh, the the FIFA gods and and the money making machine that is FIFA and and. UEFA and attended an International Champions Cup match Mm -hmm. between Roma and who? Roma and Real Madrid in New York City. And to my delight, because you never know who's going to play in these, both teams put out very solid lineups. Real Madrid included Keylor Navas, Nacho, Sergio Ramos, Tony Cruz, Isco, Benzema, Marco Asensio, who scored, and Gareth Bale, who scored. Nice. Roma countered with a very solid lineup, including De Rossi playing the full 90, which shocked me. But Edin Dzeko was playing, Diego Perotti, Stephen El Shirari. I didn't learn much. That I was enjoyed my next question. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed my, game, my time. I went to MetLife Stadium for the first time in New York City, mm-hmm. or New Jersey which I also discovered is an extreme pain <laughs> to get to. And from. And from. <laughs> I, I expected it, you know. I knew that it, that was going to be the case, but you really just don't know until you do it. It is shambolic. But I learned firsthand, I guess I already knew this, but Gareth Bale is very fast and very smart. And he was just, every, it, and this was a friendly, but it seemed like every step he took was in the right direction. Yeah, it's a big season for Bale. He's supposed yeah. to replace Ronaldo. Exactly. Good luck with that. <laughs> I don't think he'll replace him, but no, he'll be I think Real will he'll be, be very... He'll have a calf injury by October <laughs> um, How much did you pay for the tickets? Uh, I think we paid $65. That's it? Yeah, it wasn't expensive. They were secondhand, wasn't sold out. You sitting outside the stadium? or No, we were, we were inside. Okay. It wasn't sold out, so... Yeah, all of that. But uh, what was the attendance? Do we know? It's a great question. I want to say, oh, I got it right here. Fifty-one thousand five hundred. I think the place fits like seventy plus. Yeah. So, uh, was it worth it? Well, you know, was it worth the time and the money? It was worth the time with friends. <laughs> The experience. The experience. The Did you get your $65 worth is what I'm asking. Yes, but I, I guess I would say, um, well, no, considering that I've been to you know, a live Premier League match for less money, I guess not. <laughs> Do you feel cheated? I, I, I don't feel cheated only because I had a good time, only because I was with some very good friends that I don't see very often. But... You know, you kind of take away the factors outside of the soccer game that we're making it a fun time. Mm-hmm. Maybe the soccer game itself is not exactly all that great. Plus, I got to see some legitimate players where, I guess this is their last match before actually starting their seasons. Uh, yeah, it's possible. So if you attend an International Champions Cup match, say, two weeks ago, mm-hmm. it's probably a different story. Yeah. Um, that's that's the crucial uh, distinction. Yeah, is when the games happen. If you catch them in August, might be a decent one. Might not. Yeah. Catch it in July. E. Good luck. <laughs> Especially in a World Cup year. Right. Yeah. Luka Modric uh, was not on the 18 ro- man roster. No. Or I think it was a much larger roster than 18. Yeah. He, he had a busy summer. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I guess that does it for us. Unless you got anything for me. Were you at any li live soccer matches, Marcus? <laughs> no. I don't think so. Well, <laughs> Premier League. I go to games. Well, I, I, <laughs> I feel like you would have told me by now. Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the Premier League begins tomorrow as well as League Un. Then I think the rest of the European leagues, if not next weekend, are the weekend after. So enjoy the rebirth of soccer for the 2018-19 campaign. And be sure to check back with us. If you want to follow along with our programming, you can find our podcast on iTunes by searching Nessen. That's N-E-S-N on iTunes, where you get access to all Nessen podcasts, including every episode of the Nessen Soccer Podcast. Marcus, thank you. Oh, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. I'm excited for another another year. See you next week. Oh,